What's up, guys? Today's going to be an early, early chat for me. It's 8 o'clock. <clears throat> Let's see who we got in the chat today. Come on a second here. What's up, guys? What's up, Kanga? Kanga in the house. Fred. Fred. We got moderator Fred. What's up, buddy? <clears throat> Sorry, I don't have my glasses on. I can't see anything. <clears throat> so what are we going to talk about today? We've got... I figure we just do a little weekly recap. Maybe take a couple questions. So what we did this past week... Actually, the new uh, new releases today. Let's talk about 4K Blu-rays for a quick second, huh? Uh, so this past week, we watched Speed on 4K Blu-ray, which personally I thought was like just all right looking. I didn't think it was like fantastic looking or anything like that. It was, I think I said in the video that I thought that it only looked kind of like a really good Blu-ray. You know when you see certain Blu-rays or if you're streaming something on like Netflix or HBO Max or something, it's only in 1080p and you and you just think to yourself, oh, this looks like a really good 1080p transfer. And that's kind of what I thought the newest release of Speed looked like. I think I got a few comments on that particular video where folks said they thought it was like the best looking 4K transfer they had seen. <clears throat> I'm thinking to myself, like, seriously? The best 4K transfer you've ever seen? It's kind of a stretch. So, uh, anyways, yeah, I, I, I don't understand some of those comments. Like, sometimes I'll see comments like that in these older catalog transfers where it's like speed, or if it's like 2001, <clears throat> or like Jaws. And this is like the best transfer you guys have ever seen. I love those comments. I'm like, guys, really, man? Are you blind? Are you blind to what, man? Speed is a good-looking transfer. Not the best. Definitely not the best. Only as good as a... Um, only as good as a... As a really good-looking Blu-ray, I would say. Audio, too. Audio also didn't get an upgrade to uh, Dolby Atmos or DTSX. So that was a bummer. Although, if you want to do up mixing with like Dolby Atmos, Neural X, my bad, not Dolby Atmos, Dolby Surround, or Neural X, it up mixes pretty well. If I'm doing a review, I usually don't do uh, don't use up mixing, but if I'm just watching it just to enjoy something by myself, then sometimes I'll use up mixing. Most of the time, I think I'll use usually Dolby Surround up mixing. Give me a second here. I need to get my glasses on because I can't read the screen. <clears throat> but yeah, if you're—I mean, if you were on the fence about picking up, picking up uh, speed on Blu-ray, 4K, I would say definitely do it. It's a good, it is a good-looking transfer. It's noticeable over the the standard Blu-ray because I, I watched it. I think I watched it like a week ago. Just on regular, I think uh, on my older Blu-ray, and I thought it was uh, definitely more, maybe like dnr I think there was some edge enhancement on it. It was a little more orangier looking, a little more reddish, much warmer. And then the 4K transfer was, uh, for sure, much better looking, much more natural looking. Still a little orange, a little orange tinge here and there, but a good upgrade nevertheless. <clears throat> Audio. You know, like I said in the in the video, it did win, it did win an Oscar for sound effects and sound editing. So I mean, it's got good sound. I remember watching it back in the Adobe Digital days, five point one days. I used to always use that disc just for just for a couple scenes there with the chopper flyover, and uh, there was actually one part where he's in the counters in the highway in the Jag, and he hits the water. If you listen to that part, it should sound right when he hits that big that yellow. Uh, I don't know what it's called, like a barrier. 
and the water splashes, it should sound like it blows over your head into the back speakers or the side speakers. So that's that's another scene I usually used. I used to use all the time when I had uh, Dolby Digital. Way, 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 way back then. Early days. So that's speed. I forgot what I gave. I think I gave it like an 8.4 for video, 8.5 for audio. <clears throat> Good solid upgrade all around. Sometimes I'm I'm think sometimes I think I'm too generous on these uh releases lately. Like I feel like I've been given everything like eight <laughs> everything's like in the eights. Like I thought about giving it something in the sevens, but I was like, you know, it's a it's good enough. It's a good enough upgrade over the standard Blu-ray to I think to warrant uh a rating in the eights. So I kept it in the eights. And for a five point one mix, obviously it's not gonna be in the nines if you're putting it up against like an Atmos mix, but Definitely a good 8.5 for Atmos for that particular transfer. <clears throat> uh, what else did I do this past week? I don't recall what I did. I know I, just, I know we did the live stream with uh, with Raphael from the Raf Cave. I think that's all I really did this past week, right? For review review wise, though, I do have the SVS Micro video. Maybe dropping tomorrow, maybe dropping, what is tomorrow, Wednesday, either tomorrow or Thursday, I should be dropping the SVS Micro review. I got two of those guys in here. <clears throat> Good little subwoofers. I don't think you're going to purchase those as dedicated like home theater subs because they are so tiny. They put they do put out a lot of bass for for what they are, but as for dedicated HT subs, you know, unless you got like a smaller smallish room, probably not the first choice. I couldn't see people dropping, you know, that much money on these little tiny things for a music system. These things rock for music. I got them hooked up to the uh, my two channel, and they rock for that. Plus, they got that cool app too. Uh, may the force be with you, Craig Osterberg. Today is May the fourth. I put up a post earlier <clears throat> for the. Uh, there are some deals out there for the Star Wars movies. It's um, on the Cloud Escape. On the Cloud Escape, they're like ten bucks a title, which is pretty cool because Cloud Escape is usually pretty, you know, kind of a, they're kind of pricey. They're about like thirty, thirty, thirty-five bucks or so on the uh, Cloud Escape. But today. For May the 4th, they are only 10 bucks, And I did pick up... I only picked up one. I, I just picked up The Last Jedi. I know a lot of people hate The Last Jedi, but I think it has pretty good sound on it, so that's why I paid the $10 for it. I also picked up... Um, I also picked up Edge of Tomorrow on the Cloud Escape. I have Edge of Tomorrow on Voodoo since it's in Atmos, but I figured since I'm buying the Star Wars... I might as well just pick up Edge of Tomorrow, and I'll just do a, I'm probably going to do a re-review on that later today. I'm going to watch that again tonight. And I might do a review on that either tonight or tomorrow morning, because I'm sure they're going to release that at some point in time on 4K Blu-ray. And Cloud Escape is essentially 4K Blu-ray, so if that's any kind of like a, a precursor of what Edge of Tomorrow would look like, it's going to look the way it does on, uh, on the Cloud Escape. And when I had originally did Edge of Tomorrow, I think like three years ago now, there was no Atmos, but it was 4K on iTunes. And then I think uh, Voodoo picked it up and then they uh, released the the Atmos version. So I'm going to redo that, re-review re that one with Atmos. And I can show, uh, show you guys what it's doing in the Atmos viewer as well, which should be pretty cool. Uh, what else we got here? Will I review the SVS Micro? I'm pretty sure I just talked about that one. Uh, shame with these good but not great 4K transfers. Do you think it's more directly reflective of the of the work put into it or not into the transfer? Or does it more often have to do with source material? I'm not sure, man. Because, uh, you know, like some of the Star Wars movies are pretty good looking. They came out when you know, 70s or so, 80s. And, 
you know. I would say maybe if they spent a little bit more time, it could look better. Like speed could look better. Maybe. Like, I don't know. I'm not a I'm not a professional video expert. So I can't really say for sure. But I know cer- certain movies from the 90s that look stellar. My favorite movie, my favorite transfer from the 90s would have to be uh, Leon the Professional. Like that movie holds up today and still looks like it was shot like yesterday like that's that's maybe my favorite catalog title i would say this looks better than it, like apocalypse now or 2001 and um I, I feel like that leon the professional doesn't get enough love great this like better looking transfer than a lot of transfers we get today so if you have not picked up leon the professional pick it up stellar knockout <clears throat> Divan, what's up, Divan? <clears throat> Can you do a roomy remote setup? Can I do a roomy remote setup? You know, I thought about it. I feel like it would take too long because it's like you gotta like dig certain devices you have to dig into you know, your IP, sometimes you got to set static IP addresses. Um, it's really, actually, it's not really that hard. I mean, just as long as you, um, just, just as long as you know your IP address to your devices, you can, you can pretty much hook up Roomy to like anything. The only issue that I had lately with Roomy is I upgraded my JVC projector and for whatever reason, I don't know if they changed the protocol on it. But like changing the anamorphic settings will now just shut off the projector. So if I'm like going from like um, aspect rate, like anamorphic A, B, or C, if you go directly to it, sometimes it'll just shut it right off. So I'm not sure what's up with that. But I upgraded to the latest firmware on the, on the my NX7. I'm getting some weird, weird things with their Rumi remote and, and the projector. So I got to figure that out. Um, you've done a lot of review on Emotiba Electronics. How about speakers? Mm, yeah, I don't know, man. I've done their their amps and their pre pros. Haven't done their speakers just only only because I haven't been. To me personally, they they just don't look attractive enough for me to do. Like, I don't know. Just a personal preference. Like, I if I do a speaker, I gotta like like the way that it looks. And to me, the Emotiva speakers, they just don't have that uh, certain quality that makes me want to <laughs> spend some time to actually listen to them. That's the only reason why. You know what they say? You know, looks is a subjective thing, like sound and movies is a subjective thing. And the look of these particular speakers, subjectively, I would say, do not quite interest me. So that's why I have not done any of the uh, Emotiva, Emotiva speakers. I have done their subwoofers though. Their subwoofers are pretty good. I think it's like the RS thirteen or something like that. That was a that was a decent uh, subwoofer. <clears throat> um, give me a second here. I'm going to recommend your name and weathering with you. I think they look good in 4K, but they are great anime. I'm not sure what that means. I'm going to recommend your name and weathering with you. <clears throat> Martin Logan Motion or Bowers 7 Series for Home Theater. Bowers 7, or I would have to go with the Martin Logan Motion Series over the Bowers 7 Series. I would assume you're talking about like the 7, 705s, 702s. Um, I personally like the way the, the Martin Logan's, the uh, the Folded Motion tweeters sound over their, over their Diamond tweeters. Like I think, a, I think the, the ribbons sound better. I mean, I still have the, where are those? I still have the 705s here somewhere. And uh, 
I had the 705s and the Bowers 80, 803s. I wasn't a fan of those tweeters. To me personally, I think the uh, the ribbon tweeters are much more detailed. And the Focals with the beryllium tweeters, even more detailed. And then I think their electrostats. My electrostat, the electrostats I had, either the ESLXs or the um, the big boys, the 13s, 13As I had. My favorite speakers. I think those are the most detailed. Personally, I think detail is the best with, with the electrostats. Although I have heard like the magna pans are supposed to be pretty good too. So I was thinking about maybe getting some magna pans in. I think those LCRs are like $600. So I might get those. I, since I, I had to buy, I bought the, the Kef LS50s. And I've I've since sold those, so I might take the funds that I got from the LS50s and pick up a pair of Magna Pans because I heard good things about those Magna Pans, and they're not really expensive, you know. They're like six 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 fifty or something like that. What's up, No Name to Fame? Speaking of the uh, LS50s. <clears throat> seven seven eight all day. I'm pretty sure that Arcam is still pretty sure that Arcam is still buggy as hell. I know I had the audio controls in here. I don't know if how many of you guys saw that little teaser video I put up of the audio control, but the only reason I couldn't do the audio control because it was really buggy. And I installed I had two different audio control pre pros. They sent me two different ones, and it was just really buggy. I mean, for me personally, like, I couldn't get it to work. It was popping and cracking, a lot of hiss. I was getting some weird interference. I tried I tried, two, I tried two different audio control pre-pros, like the, the big one, the X9, the $10,000 one. I tried it on, in my place on two different setups. I tried it with the Mac setup, with the Macintosh amps, and I tried it with the Emotiva amps, and then I bought it to my... Uh, I brought it to my friend's house and he tried it on his system in his house. And we had the same issues on both units. So it was kind of weird that it was, you know, I highly doubt. I mean, it's possible that I had two, two defective audio control pre-pros. But, I mean, we tried two different ones in two different locations. Well, two different households on several different locations. And just, they were just really, they were noisy on... uh on both setups, so really, uh, I was really bummed about that because I was a big fan of the X5 when I had that in like what 2017, and um, that thing was just like rock solid, one of my favorite pre pros that I reviewed. But unfortunately, no, I couldn't, I couldn't wrap up the audio control review. So between the uh, NAD and the audio control, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say NAD. Although I think you're limited to like nine channels or something like that. <clears throat> What's up, Snoots? What do you think? Of, what do you think between these three options? A Rendell 1723S Towers Center, JBL HDI Bookshelf Center. Um, yes, I have not heard the S and Sierra Bookshelf, so I can't say about that. Will one excel more for home theater? Um, I have heard the JBLs. I haven't heard the S and Sierra, so I can't really speak on that. But between the JBL and the Arendels, I'm definitely going to have to go with the Arendels. I miss the Arendels. I would kind of wish they had. Uh, I wish they had speakers that would, would that would fit my space a little bit better. Because even for my space, the 1723s's were massive. I mean, I guess I suppose if I had like a bigger room, it it would be a better fit for me. But I just felt like they were like way too big for my space. I mean, I think even in the videos you can tell they were just really big. Uh, where we got it? Uh, Shane, are you feeling okay? It looks like water in that glass. Yes, it is. Look at that sparkling water. Got sparkling water right there. It's all good. It's oh, it's only eight o'clock here. Got to keep it, uh, got to keep it nice, you know. Uh, 
Uh, no name says he's still rocking the M5. Love it. Zero issues. Nice. I wonder where did you get your M5 from? I'm curious. <laughs> here's, a, here's a question I get often. Where's that Mac Amp review? Beautiful. Uh, the Mac Amp review. So, so here's the thing with a Mac Amp review. Usually the products that I purchase myself that I that I plan to keep, that usually those usually take me the longest because I know I'm not in a rush to do them. Whereas if somebody sends me something to review, normally I have like a month or two or three or so to to wrap up the review. So since the Macintosh amps are mine, I really have no need to finish it up. And I haven't seen another review on YouTube, so it's like it's pretty rare that you'll see a multi channel amp that costs ten thousand dollars that a lot of people are going to review just because it's 10,000 bucks. So um, I have not felt the, the, the need to do it anytime soon. But I think I think the review should speak for itself because I did purchase it myself because I thought it was that good. And it's still in my system almost one year later. So if that says anything to you, it must be a pretty good amplifier. And I also, my second system, I do have Emotiva amplifiers as well. So I mean Emotiva amps and um, and the Macintosh amps, solid amps. But I will I will get to that. I will get to that. It's uh it's in my schedule of things to do. I just haven't gotten around to doing it yet. <clears throat> when is the Procella review dropping? I don't know if I can say or not, but. I was going to do the review soon, but there have been some changes to those particular models, so there really is no point in me to review those particular models without me saying too much, so I don't know how much I could say. But I did reach out to them again, and um, I haven't heard back, so I'm not sure what's going on. But um, just know that with the P10s that I have, or my bad, P10s, the P6s, I'm not going to do a review on these particular speakers, so I'm not going to follow up on that until I hear back from the guys and uh, maybe they'll send me something else new to review. But as far as as the P6s, there's going to be there's going to be no follow-up on the P6s. So without me telling you too much, there's going to be no review on the P6s. Although they are good-sounding speakers. I do like them. Well, I guess since I'm not going to do a review, I can I can give give you my thoughts on the way they sound. Um, so if I was going to compare like the Procella P6s to my own Bowers and Wilkins, I would say the Bowers have a more uh st studio like I think I said in my review too, like more of a studio monitor esque type of feel, more of a hi fi esque feel. And the P6s have more of a, maybe of a, a pro style, maybe like like a pro style speaker feel, something that you would hear more of like in a cinema, where maybe quite possibly the most highest fidelity nuanced isn't produced as delicately as it would be on a hi-fi speaker. Which I don't know. I don't know if I would attribute that to the driver itself or to the horn. It's not really a horn. It's more like a like a waveguide. Uh, the compression driver. I don't know if it's the most conducive to being the most articulate in detail. Whereas the Bowers, obviously, they have more of a pedigree in hi-fi speakers, so you kind of get that feeling with the Bowers or even the Arendelle. The um, the Procellas are like effortless sounding. They can these things, you can just feed it whatever you want to feed it, power watts wise, and they will just like belt out a lot of SPL, not even like crack. The on the Bowers, on certain material, I've learned that if a uh, frequency is a little too high, the treble on those soft domes can you know you can get a bit more compression on the Bowers. Whereas the compression driver on the Procellas just, you know, they just, they just keep going. They just keep getting louder. Um, 
at lower levels, I would probably give more detail and a little bit more finesse to the Bowers. But as far as like filling a bigger space, I'm going to have to go with the Procellas. The Procellas have this sound quality that, you know, it's more like, um, it, it kind of sounds like you're sitting in a movie theater. It sounds like, you know, movie theaters don't have like the most, the most uh, nuanced textures, I would say. But it fills out a big space, like the dispersion on it. Fill, they, it fills out a very wide space um, good off axis response it plays loud it's plenty detailed for sure I'm not going to knock it there but um, I think there's a more of a musical quality with the Bowers or the Rendles or with the Focals of course but uh, there's more of an effortless quality with the P6s which um, which you don't get which you don't get with the uh, with my Bowers or, or the other brands that I just mentioned so it's um, it's different. It's a different, it's different. Uh, it's a different experience amongst, you know, the other speakers that I've had, and then this one, which I would say the compression driver is uh, probably the the main difference there. Also, you do have to cr you, these must be crossed over at like eighty hertz because these speakers they don't produce any kind of bass, whereas I can cross my Bowers over. At like I usually I have my Bowers crossed over I think at like fifty five hertz or something somewhere around fifty five fifty hertz or something like that, so I get a I get more of a more of that kind of that uh, mid presence there, so like vocals and stuff like that maybe like a gunshot might be a little bit more tactile in the specific speaker that it's coming at you, whereas on the P sixes since I'm crossing it over at the 80 hertz it doesn't quite punch as hard so it's like you gotta you gotta cross it over um but uh there's more presence with the p6s as far as like you know the high frequency response and that the left back speaker or something like that i made the surround channel so that's the difference uh that'd be like the main takeaway that i t that, I'm, that i'm taking from the p6s and the and my Bowers or any other speaker, which is more of a, you know, you know, most speakers that I've had in there are more like hi-fi speakers. They pull double duty for like music and home theater. I think I, I would say like most of the speakers I've had in there, it's more like more of like they're more like hi-fi. You know what I mean? They're not really designed with home theater in mind. They just happen to make a very nice musical speaker and they just happen to take that same musical speaker, and make a center channel speaker and maybe design a smaller one to make it as a surround speaker but it's not like purposely meant to um to be only home theater centric you know if that makes sense whereas the p6s sound kind of crappy with music i'll be honest with you i put it in the living room i put it on the living room with uh, the cambridge and uh nad and we were using it for music and i was just like yo this doesn't sound so hot for for music so Definitely more of a home theater centric type of speaker, and you can tell aesthetically it just looks like a theater speaker. But I mean, if you're uh, if you're tight for space, if you're tight for space, I mean these things are like twelve inches deep, twelve or thirteen inches deep. They're very shallow, e super easy to place. I've been, you know, I've been on the. I don't know if you're on my Patreon. Anybody that's on my Patreon. You know, there was a there was a time I was thinking about getting rid of my Bowers for the Procellas which I could still do. It's not a, not a problem. So I've been on the fence for whether or not I want to just keep the Procellas or not. You know, if I can get another, if I could fill, round out all 11 locations. Right now I've only got five, so I've got five and I'm kind of mixing them with the Bowers and they sound radically different from each other, like timbre-wise. But I've been making do, though. Just different, different sound experiences. I mean, I guess, you know, sound is a subjective thing. I wouldn't say the Procellas are better than any other speaker that I have. It's just a different experience. And, you know, I like it. I, I like it. Certain things I, I like about having, like, a more full-range speaker, like the Arendels. Like, you could run the Arendel, the 1723Ss, full range. You can run them full and then cross over your subs uh, wherever they blend the best once you take your measurements. But then, and I think that's probably, like, the maybe one of the best-sounding speakers I've I've heard in my theater. 
as far as like frequency response, you know, just letting, letting those, letting all the rental speakers rip full range, you know, despite what people say, you know, cross them over at 80 Hertz, the, uh, the standard, I th once you, uh, once you get some capable speakers that you can let them go full range, man, it's, it's different, man. Um, you know, when they say like a gunshot from the back speaker that you, uh, you know, surround, surround speakers can run full range. Like you can get that gunshot full range. You can get that airplane full range coming from your back speakers from the overhead speakers like there's bass up there and you know if you're going to try to run the procellus full range like it just don't work like there's no bass it's not you're not going to get any bass there so that's a one quality that i would probably still keep my bowers over the procellus although i do like the like the dispersion on the procellus are really nice because they got that big waveguide and it still has that big you get that you get a much bigger sound with those waveguides rather than like the just the regular soft dome that I have, have on my bowers which is just like standard it's like flush against the uh, the baffle same almost just pretty much the same experience that you get with the uh, the rendels too the rendels have a massive waveguide on there one of the, i think that was the biggest sound that i've gotten in my theater was, was with the rendels second would have to be the uh be the procellas then the, probably the most detailed speakers I've had in my theater would have to be the Focals, most detailed, and then runner-up for detail would have to be would have to be the uh, the Rendels, and then next would be the Bowers. So different different speakers for different people for different experiences. Whatever you think you want to get out of your speakers, totally different, totally different. But. Great speakers nonetheless. If you can get a great deal on some P6s, I'd say go for it. I'm pretty sure you'll be happy. <clears throat> Super chat. What's up, D Duval59? Simple question for you. But what's your favorite movie and is it on 4K? If so, have you reviewed it? My fave is unfortunately Terminator 2, so I won't be getting it on 4K anytime soon, sadly. My favorite movie, you know, I don't think I have a favorite movie. I got, I got many movies that I enjoy that I watch over and over again. One of my favorite movies is going to come out in 4K, uh, Heat. Heat is one of my favorite movies. I think I talked about that before. So Heat's supposed to be coming out soon. I mean, I've got it on Vudu and iTunes. And it's 4K there, so I've had that forever, so... And I don't think it's going to come out with Atmos. I mean, maybe it is. I don't I don't know what the specs are for the 4K Blu-ray, but I don't think it's Atmos. I mean, I could be wrong, though. But that's one of my favorite movies. And, um, I mean, that's that's a 4K. So, yeah. Terminator 2 looks like crap on 4K Blu-ray, as everyone knows. I believe they did the transfer for it. I think when they uh, made the 3D version, they must have pulled whatever they did for the 3D version over to 4K. Because the 3D version, if I'm not mistaken, looks like it's been DNR'd as well. So, um, I mean, there's that. Oh, it's my bad. I don't know what happened there. I got kicked out of StreamYard. Stream garbage would just be doing that sometimes. It's just like, like boost you off. Uh, but yeah, man, you know, no, I don't have like a favorite, favorite movie. I love he, I love the, I love the Snyder movies. I love, I love the Batman movies from Snyder. I love Batman v Superman. I love Man of Steel. I love those kind of movies. Good action movies. <clears throat> Ooh, what else we got here yeah my camera my camera got booted got booted off can you comment on the arrangement of tweeters mounted in cabinets below the mid-range like the arendals does it align better for seating i find them too low for my liking well you're supposed to um you're supposed to align the tweeters with your ears I've always, all my tweeters have always been right at my ear level. So I've never have, a, I've never had a problem with that. Mm. The only, the only thing that I've had a problem with 
was putting the Procellas behind my screen. So since the since my screen is up, you know, it's it's kind of up higher. The um if I if I line up my the Procella speakers, the tweeters at ear level, then it's sitting right at the bottom of my screen, like the the bottom if I was the, you know, if you're going to take a screen and chop it up into thirds, so you'd have the top, middle, and bottom, the Procellas would sit right at the bottom third, lower third of my projection screen. And that just doesn't sound right, especially for vocals. I think we spoke about this with home theater engineering when on the last podcast we did. I think it's uh, over on the other channel if you want to watch that on Dynamically Challenge. If you're not subscribed to Dynamically Challenge, go over there. This is where this pot, this is where this is going to live. I'm going to take it off here and put it over there. But um, for me, you're supposed to align the tweeters with at ear height. Because I have found, uh, at least for my situation on the screen, even though the tweeters were at ear height, um, vocals and everything just sounded out of place because everybody's talking above, right above the speaker. You can you can clearly hear that it's different. So I, I think I think when they say, like, you know, when you align your tweeters at ear height, that, you know, that's a tough call. Because, like, for t- people with TVs, it's like, how do people with TVs do that? Because typically the tweeters, the center channel is going to be below the television set. And then it kind of looks stupid above the TV. And then, you know, the left and right channels, that's a little bit easier. You can always get, like, a little stand or boost it up or something like that to get the left and right side ear height. Um and then, of course, the surround channels. Surround channels are kind of tough, too. But I do find this surround channels, the surround channels and the back channels, typically I, I used to have them maybe about two feet above ear level. And um, I found that that was better for, like, uh, different rows of seats. Better for the second row of seat because it was up higher. But then the, for the first row, it was a little bit off. So it's like I kind of put it, I think I have it about maybe like a... F- half a foot or so above ear level for the surround channels, you know, if I was doing two rows. But since I'm only doing one row now, right at ear level. So, you know, for sound panning at least, everything is very, very precise when it moves. Although now that I've had to raise my uh, the tweeters <laughs> maybe like three foot higher uh, for my front channels just to match the screen image, it does throw it off a little bit. I'm not going to lie. It does throw it off. But it does. But I think since your eyes are so focused on the screen, that this this the the audio just kind of comes at you, since your head is already pointed in the direction of the screen. If it's tilted upwards, it kind of sh- all three all three uh, front channels kind of shoot at you at the same time, then kind of just slowly move downwards across this across the side speakers and across the back channels. So it's like a smooth transition, regardless when they say kind of like ear level the front channel uh the front sound stage i think just as long as it's like your eyes are visually looking at the center of that screen and the audio is coming directly at the center of the screen that you can your ears and your mind will just automatically make it follow the sound as it moves across the your your sound stage from the front side to back i don't think that was the exact question that you asked but that's the that's the answer i'm giving you though Um, uh, can't wait to get Justice League on physical. You know what I tried to do? I tried to um, I tried to pick up Justice League on. I tried to pick up Justice League on the Cloud Escape because you can buy Justice League on the Cloud Escape already. So I don't know how many people have Cloud Escape right now, but on the Cloud Escape. But if you have Cla- or, if you have Justice League on the Cloud Escape now. Then leave a comment down below. Leave a comment and let us know if the audio is different on that over the HBO Max stream. Because I tried to buy it with my VPN. I tried to VPN and buy the UK version since it's available. But uh, I can't because it's like um, I need to have like a UK credit card or a UK payment method. So, I mean, if you got a Cloud Escape... Zack Snyder's Justice League is available there now. You just can't buy it. You just can't buy it in the U.S. Unfortunately, until it goes uh, until it goes proper and legal. 
in the uh, in the America, in U.S. But it's definitely going to come if it's on the Cladoscape. It's definitely going to come at some point on 4K Blu-ray. What's up, Raf? Raf in the house. I see those boxes aren't disappearing. You'll need a separate storage unit. That is true. I've actually added more boxes. <laughs> I've added a couple more, few more boxes. Uh, what's a film that you want to be released on 4K that isn't already? Film that I want released on 4K that isn't already would have to be. So I picked up a couple movies on iTunes recently. I picked up, I picked up all the Anchorman movies. I want Anchorman one to come on 4K. I picked up uh Austin Powers one on digital. And uh, I think uh, I'm a simple guy. I just want those two little silly movies. I want Anchorman. I want Anchorman 1 to come out on 4K. I want I want Austin Powers 1 to come out on 4K. Actually, I take all of them. All of them are pretty funny. I want those to come out on 4K. Anchorman, I mean, uh, Austin Powers should look pretty good in 4K. It's, it's a colorful movie. It's got some uh, cheesy music. I think that's going to sound great in Atmos. And I want Zoolander to come out on 4K too. I want those three comedy movies to come out on 4K. Those three movies I can watch all the time and be amused every time I watch them. Those are the only three comedy movies that I can always, always enjoy. Maybe not the answer you're looking for, but that's the answer you got. Um, Snoots question I've been wondering about. I've measured my KF92 at different locations and always have a 15 hertz null. While adding a second fix for that, or will adding a second fix that for sure or not, since it will be in one of those spots. I would, yeah, you could definitely add a second subwoofer, add a second KF92, and, um, you can usually adjust your phase or adjust your um, distance settings, and you can usually get that out of there. Wait, you have a null at 15 hertz? That's a... Uh, hmm. I mean, one of those subs, one of those subs go down in your place. Probably 11 hertz, right? I mean, that's a... Uh, it's a tough null right there. I, I don't know how those subs would react in your room. So, I mean, some people don't even hear. Some people don't even get 15 hertz in their spots. So that's like uh, some movies don't even hit 15 hertz. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, adding a second one and making sure that you have them EQ properly. I know you can't really EQ them in uh, the. You can't really EQ them in the subwoofers themselves because there's no DSP. But if you know how to EQ them within your pre-pro or AVR, then uh, I would say, yeah, you shouldn't have a problem. You shouldn't have a problem getting that, getting that null figured out. So get a second one. Get another KF92. Don't get some other bullshit sub. Get like a get the same subwoofer. McGruber just got a new Blu-ray release today. McGr Man, I haven't seen McGruber in forever. I don't recall liking that movie too much, but I'm, that might be one of those things I have to watch again. <clears throat> oh, so let's talk about uh, so so I've been on a I've been on the TV binge lately. I don't know how many of you guys watch shows. Tip, normally I don't like to watch TV shows because I don't like to get invested in TV shows where you got to watch like multiple episodes. But I will say that, I don't know, I got bored the past few days. Um, but I, I've been binging a lot of TV shows. I watched, let me know if you guys have seen this, any of these shows. Since, you know, since I like like Zoolander and stuff like that. I like these like cheesy comedies. Not really cheesy. I think they're good comedies. 
I, w- I binge watched uh, Vice Principals on HBO Max. Like, how good is that show? With uh, Danny McBride. I, I binge watched all uh, that whole season there. I watched, um, what's the other one he was in? The Righteous Gemstones. Have you guys seen The Righteous Gemstones? I think that was only one season. I think Vice Principals is two seasons, then it's done. Like, there's no continuation. The Righteous Gemstones, I think, is one season. Um, funny show. <laughs> Super funny shows. The Righteous Gemstones is about, like, you know, these televangelists and how they, like, make all this money. But it's within their family. Hilarious show. I think it's hilarious. I, l- I love Danny McBride. He's funny. And then I watched... Um, on Amazon Prime, I watched all of this show called uh, Louder Milk. It's from the Far- Farley, Bro- Farley Brothers. You know, the guys that did, like, there's something about Mary and um, that one with Jim Carrey, which uh, me, myself, and Irene, you know, those guys that did that, those movies. So I don't I don't think it played, no, it doesn't take place in Seattle. It takes place in, it doesn't take place in Rhode Island. It takes place in Seattle. So, uh, you know, it's got that kind of indie comedy feel to it. Louder Milk is good. Season three just dropped like this past week. Funny show if you like mo- shows about alcoholics. <laughs> that's, a f- that's a funny one too. And then today I wrapped up Invincible. Since everybody's been talking about Invincible, I watched that yesterday and I wrapped up the eighth episode this morning. And that's a, it's a cartoon. It's an animated show on Amazon Prime. But it's really good though. Um, a lot of killing killing a lot of people in it and i was thinking to myself like who like why would they not make a live action version of invincible and how could Zack snyder not be the best guy to do invincible as a live action series or movie because it's like a dark comedy there's a big uh big character arc with omni man and then I, i would assume that uh the kid the son is probably gonna have a pretty big arc as well so I think, listen, if they can make a live-action Invincible show, my God, that would be such a great show. It's kind of like the animated version of The Boys almost as far as like violence and, and action-wise. I did I did YouTube it just to find out what happens with the whole series, for at least as far as the comic books go. And uh, like I know what happens now at the end of the entire series. But good cartoon. I don't even like cartoons. I don't like watching animated stuff, but... Yo, that's a good show. If you got, if you haven't seen the Vice Principals, hilarious. The Righteous Gemstones, hilarious. Louder Milk, hilarious. Eh, funny, and then Invincible. Four great television series. HBO Max, Amazon Prime. Watch them. Good shows. I wa- I wasted about a good good solid th- four days of my life watching all those. Uh, <laughs> binge watching all those last week so that's what I've been watching uh, what else we got still have to watch Vice Prince oh yeah yo Eastbound and Down also hilarious too I watched that a couple years ago that's also a good show I always wanted to have like another another uh, another season but they never came out with another season but I do think they're coming out with season two of The Righteous Gemstones. Fucking funny show. Let me see. There's this one joke that the sister has where she's in the diner. And she she was like uh, so turned on by her by her teacher. Where she was like where she was like she got up from her desk and she left a snail trail on her chair. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Maybe you guys are not old enough to get that joke, but it's pretty damn funny. <laughs> uh, spring change is sober today. Am I, though? <laughs> Am I, though? You should watch... You watch the boys, yeah, yeah. I've, def- I've watched, I've watched the boys on Amazon Prime. I watched the both ups, both seasons. I thought, I thought season one of the boys was better than season two. Hopefully, uh, season three is better. 
I mean, season two was still good. What did you think of the Marvel trailer that came out yesterday? Mm. Uh, I guess it was all right. It was all right. I mean, Shang-Chi's there. They showed Shang-Chi and like a three-second clip of what, Eternals. Not They didn't really show much of that. I think there is, they, they teased the Fantastic Four. I mean, even though it is legit right now. Uh, Black Widow. I mean, it looked good. Looked good. Looked decent, I guess. You know, the only thing, you know, what really bothers me when the Shang Chi trailer dropped. I don't know. I don't know why. I I think I would have to blame the Wu Tang for this, but it's like every time you see a kung fu movie, like, do they have to play rap with it or hip hop with it? Like, do they got to do that? So that's like the only thing that kind of. When I saw the Chang, Shang Chi trailer, I was like, I think they started playing rap, right? Was it rap or some kind of pop song? No, it was like rap music, I think. It's like, why is rap music always associated with like like martial arts movies? Like, I don't get that. Like, why does it have to be rap music? Like, I couldn't, like, when I saw that trailer, I was like, yo, they can't make it. They can't make like the first Asian Marvel superhero be like serious. They got to make it like mainstream rap music in the trailer. Like, Let's make it real. Come on, man. Don't, don't put rap music in that. That's the only thing that that's that's the one thing that kind of bothered me about watching that Shang Chi trailer. I mean, otherwise, I mean, otherwise, that trailer was like everything else. Every other Marvel trailer, I mean, it's fine. It didn't do anything. Uh, didn't do anything special for me. <clears throat> You're you're good. One question trying to figure out how to trigger my old Denon 8200 amp. It's got the old-fashioned control in out on the back. Um how to trigger it? I mean, you got to make sure your 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 pre-pro's got a out as well. I just get a regular mono 3.5 or 2.5 cable for it. It should work. Unless you got a busted fuse or something like that in there. What's my favorite 4K steelbook? Listen, I'm not a collector. I'm not a collector of movies. When I was getting them for free, I, I, I was giving them away on Patreon. Or I, I sold a bunch of them. I sold a bunch of my, my hard copies off, so. I'm not, not not a collector of uh must might be tough to hear, but I'm not a collector of physical media. That's why I have a cloud escape. I, I would prefer to download the full the full quality and um rather than having a collection on my shelf. Just me. Personal preference. Or if I have the physical copy, I typically rip them and I put them on the Zipidi or on a hard drive somewhere. So that it's easier to call up if I want to watch something. I just uh, turn on the Cloud Escape or the Zipedia and just zip right to it. Or if I'm on a TV in the bedroom or in the uh, office or something like that, I can just go over to iTunes really quick and just, just watch on iTunes really fast. So I'm all about the uh, convenience. All about that convenience factor. What is this? All about the convenience factor. Did I see the Michael G. Michael B. Jordan movie without a trace? Is that what it's called? I think it's called Without Remorse. But I did not see it yet. I wanted to see it, but it was not in Dolby Atmos. I mean, if it is in Dolby Atmos, somebody let me know. But it's not in Dolby Atmos on the Apple TV or any place else I can think of. But if it is, let me know. But that's the only re I, that's why I haven't watched it because it wasn't in Atmos, and uh, no, I haven't watched it yet though. I'll get around to it. I, you know, those Tom Clancy movies. Um, none of those Tom Clancy movies really did anything for me. The video game is good, right? 
uh, Tom, Tom Clancy's Rambo Six. That's a good video game. I'll say that. But none of the movies are movies that really stick out in my mind. Like I remember. <laughs> oh, here we go. Sound was good. So, so let's talk about sound very briefly. So I I put up a post the other day asking how many people own or use a center channel, center surround channel for like a center back channel. Like we all know that there's a left and right surround channel. We all know there's a left and right surround back channel. But there's also there's also a center back channel as well, which goes right between the surround back left and surround back right. There's also that center channel as well. Um, apparently, I guess some Denon and Marantz receivers can do it. And of course, I'm sure like a Storm Audio can do it and the Chernoff can do it as well. So I asked the question on the community tab whether anyone was doing a center back surround channel. Come to find there's a, a good amount of you using center back channels. So I had someone on, uh, on the Patreon ask me what's going on with the center back channel. And at least for Dolby Atmos, the center back channel only kicks on if something is moving through it. So if something was panning like overhead from like the front of the room over to the back and it happens to fade away in the back center, then that center back channel would light up. If something was moving from surround back left, surround back right, then yeah, it would briefly, sometimes, not all the time, briefly light up, maybe for like a quick second or so. So I, I ended up watching a bunch of movies with Atmos, with the surround back channel on, and there's really not too much information in there. So I have been told that the surround back channel only really comes on if no, the mixer utilizes it. Like if something is moving through that speaker, you can pan it through that speaker and then it'll, it'll come on for like, bleep, it'll be like, bleep, a quick second. Um, I watched, uh, I put in Midway. Midway was very briefly, I clicked on within the time frame of like, from like 11 minutes, from the 11 minute mark over to like the 12 minute or like the, 13 minute mark or whatever it was during that first airplane aerial attack i think it bl clipped on like blipped on like twice i think there was a plane that flew over and then another plane that kind of like zipped from like left to right it came on like twice very briefly so that particular channel is um not uh not utilized often and i know there's a big conversation about like wide channels as well like how often are wide channels used and I think the same is going to apply to like the center back channel. Like it's only, it's only available if um, I guess the mixer actually utilizes it in that mix. So it's not always on. So when sound moves, you know, throughout the back channels, it's not always utilized. Because even when I watched, there's that part in Ready Player One where where Kong runs across the back channels, both back channels, the left and right. He actually doesn't jump through the center back channel. So whoever mixed it, they didn't they didn't put it in the center back channel. So it just kind of jumps from surround left, right, or my bad, surround back right to surround back left. So he doesn't actually go through that center back. So I guess whoever mixed that didn't utilize that specific channel. Now whether or not the metadata that he's saying, you know, skip that channel altogether, I don't know. I don't I'm not a I'm not an audio mixer, but I guess you would probably think since Kong is running in those back channels, he probably would have ran through the center back channel. But for this particular, you know, movie, it just didn't happen. Um, although for, for like Midway, you know, it happened a couple of times, whether or not, whether or not it was for a long duration, you know, it just wasn't just really quick. Um, I watched Big Fish last night. Big Fish was from it came out i think big fish got released today i watched it last night because i was going to do a review for it but i found myself falling asleep so it didn't keep my interest so i'm not going to do big fish um but know that it's only maybe as good as speed so i'm not going to give it a rating because i didn't watch it all the way through 
But for an Atmos rev- for a new Atmos remix on Big Fish, it's a very active mix, and that center back channel does kick. It does come on. It does come on quite a few times. I will say in this particular Atmos mix, although it is kind of rele- relegated only for for like music. Uh, if you're watching Big Fish, you'll you'll notice that there's a lot of music that happens in the Atmos height channels, and also the surround channels, and occasionally the surround effects the music will will bleed over into the center back i don't know why but it's, it comes on here and there in the center back channel but i will say for the majority of the time with atmos mixes the center back channel used very 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 sparingly out of one two hundred i would say it comes on maybe three percent of the time of all the movies that i've watched So it's very rare that I've heard the center back kick on with Atmos content. Although if you are using upmixing with Neural X, I guess for Neural X upmixing, if you got a center back channel, it will combine the center back left and the center back right and some a mono channel in that center back channel. And it's very active. It's on like all the time. Like it's it's loud. Like it's it's noticeably very loud. If you're using Neuralex up mixing, if you're using Dolby surround up mixing, I have yet to hear the center back channel make anything useful. But for Neuralex, whatever DTS is doing, it do, it puts a lot of info in that center back channel. So that um, that is my take on the center back channel. Is it a necessity? I suppose if your processor can process all the other seven channels correctly, that adding the center back channel doesn't hurt. Like it could add for certain movies where where um, uh, overheads might might happen to go over your head into the center back channel and disappear back there. Kind of cool for sure. But uh, I wouldn't say that it's a, a, a necessary type of thing. If you just want to put it there to put it there and you want to use Neuralex up mixing just to have the entire back sound stage full of, of audio, then you can do that as well. You can you can always turn Neuralex up mixing on any soundtrack. So if you want that, just to really give yourself full coverage. If you got a big space, like a large space, then then Neuralex up mixing could fill in that particular gap. But I think for the most pe- for the most part, uh the center back channel not too it's not used all that much very very little um i don't know if i'm going to keep the center back there or not but uh for the time being it's there and you know it's there and just does does what it does i guess so that's my take on the center back channel so thank you for you guys thanks you guys for for letting me know that you guys actually are there's a lot of you guys actually using the center back channel so are you guys using center back channels if you are, what pre-pro or receiver are you using it on? Leave a comment down below. So that's center back channel. If Christopher Nolan doesn't use a center back, then I'm out. Man, Christopher Nolan doesn't use any back channels. <laughs> he just uses side. He just uses side side channels. Greetings from Singapore. Have you compared some UHD movie releases in Europe with which have Aura 3D soundtracks from those in Atmos? I have compared uh, Jumanji. I think it's the first Jumanji with the Aura version of it. And I will say that there's that part where the... I think when they drop out of the air at the beginning, I think Jack Black gets killed first. He actually, Jack Black actually, in the oral version, he actually falls from the from the center of the room, from the center voice of God speaker. Whereas the Atmos version, I think he just comes out of like the front two height speakers, if I'm not mistaken. So, I mean, other than that, uh, I think I would still prefer the Atmos version so I didn't I don't think there was like that much of a a difference to make me like only watch the oral version of it 
I mean, I mean, it was cool that he he actually did sound like he came from the directly from above my head. So that was cool. That I mean, that's the only that's the only movie that I've that I've compared. Hey Shane, great review of the Kef first Golden Ear speakers, which I totally forgot that we did. So um, recap on the Kef versus Golden Ear review. I, you know, with with all these speaker reviews and written reviews that I've seen, I think most of the mostly on the YouTube channels and stuff like that, like the Kefs are like they're like legendary speakers, you know, like everybody loves these LS fifties. Because I guess they have like some trickle down trickle down technology from their blade series into these little little guys, little cheapy well, they're not really cheap. They're fifteen hundred bucks, they're expensive. Uh, to the smaller bookshelf models, so like like I wanted to be blown away. I've heard the Kef Blade speakers before. I've heard them with some uh, what they hear with, uh, not Levinson gear. I forgot what gear. Oh, Class A. I've heard the Blade twos with some Class A amps, and they sounded good. They sounded really good, actually. Like I wouldn't, I would definitely own them if I could afford them. So, everybody always gives the LS50s high praise and then LS50s high praise. So, I wanted to be, like, blown away by these LS50s. So, I bought the LS50s. I, no, I bought the LS50s only because Kef doesn't, Kef doesn't like to, to, to deal with the spare change channel anymore because they didn't like, they didn't like our Q50 or our, Q, or our Kef Q50 review. So, I guess they uh, they left us they left spare change hanging. They used to give me all kinds of stuff, whatever I wanted. You know, I was the first to do the the, the KF ninety two, and then they, they they sent me out the uh, the Q series speakers. So they uh, I guess they didn't like that review. I asked them multiple times to send me the LS fifties. They didn't want to send me the LS fifty Metas. Um, I had the guys on the channel to talk about the 50 metas. I emailed them multiple times. I emailed their engineers and their PR people. They didn't want to give me the speakers. So I was forced to buy the speakers myself. So I only bought them myself because because I knew they were going to be like outstanding speakers for $1,500. I knew they were going to be good. Only because everybody else said they were so good. So yes, we bought them. Uh, you know, they're like $1,500. So cool. So I also got the, uh, the Golden Air BRXs in for review, which are $1,600. And I figured there's no way, because the Golden Air BRXs are, they're a tough speaker to find a review on, because I don't think many YouTubers have reviewed them. Uh, although many of the written reviews, they give them good, they give them a good, a good rating though. Although many YouTubers, I guess they don't talk about them. I don't know why they don't talk about the Golden Air speakers. But they, do, they just don't. Maybe because they just don't look cool enough. <laughs> Even in my review, I think I said that. I didn't think they were as attractive as the Kef LS50s. Which I still don't think they are. I mean, I get the technology behind it. Maybe that's not conducive enough for having an attractive design. I don't know. But... You know, build quality definitely goes to the LS50 Metas. Them things feel like little cement bricks. Like, they're so dense. The only other speaker I would say that I have, that I had, that felt the same way as the LS50 Metas would be the Golden Ears. I mean, it would be the Q Acoustics 300s. That's because, you know, they have like the the box within a box within a box type of thing. And then there's like gel in between them. So if you knock on them, it's like knocking on this desk. It's like knocking on a one-inch piece of uh, wood. Like they're super dense, super thick. So the the fifty metas build quality is like fucking outstanding. And then you compare that to the uh, the BRXs, which is like, you know, they they kind of feel like kind of almost like a mid range speaker. And then looks wise, you know, I just I feel like they do they just don't look like to me they just don't look cool. Uh, but the the LS fifties they just look like money. They look like fifteen hundred dollars speakers. Not a fan of the black and gold, but 
they just look they look fucking cool uh but i mean the first thing that we noticed like right off the bat they were just they were just harsh they were just harsh we played around with different speaker locations uh we towed them in we tried the denon integrated we tried the nad we did the settled on the technics uh the r1000 we're gonna do a review on that i think maybe thursday um so be on the lookout for that review so um so we settled on the technics and by all accounts everything that we listened to they were just uh they were just more edgier sounding on everything that we listened to you know whether we we paired it up with the rel i got the rels in here st uh, still the uh t9 x's we use them with the rels we use them with all three different integrateds and you know to our ears they just sounded harsher sounding edgier sounding all the way through we weren't making any weren't making up any stories on this either it was just uh it was just a uh, edgier sounding what, what can what can we say no hard feelings kef because you left us hanging no hard feelings there's no animosity there uh even though we wanted to be like your speakers suck because you left us hanging we didn't do that though because we didn't have to do that because truthfully they were just edgier sounding than the golden ears were and they were uh harsher sounding than the golden ears were i mean we listened to like a bunch of listen to some nine inch nails we listened to some rock music um and it was just like uh, dude it was just like edgier sounding we did the stones like we said in the in the video where uh they had the little guitar solo at the, at the in the middle of the song and we were just like ooh, we we're like yo that's that's hard is that hard or is that just us it was hard and everything on the golden ears was just like pss, was just like smooth it was like smooth sailing man it just sounded like pleasant pleasant sounding sweet sounding high end and the guests were just edgier sounding man uh certain i could see where you know maybe they tuned it a little bit higher just because i guess you could say there might be a little bit of a wow factor where you know if you're in a showroom where you tune it up a little higher, you give that, you, you kind of like uh, give the treble a little bit more uh, emphasis where, you know, if you're just in a showroom, you're like, oh shit, that sounds loud because it's a little bit more treblier sounding. And, you know, for people that don't really actually listen to it, that could, that could be something, you know, that catches your attention. But, um, for a longer period of time like we, we sit here and listen to music for like a few hours and we'll just like we'll take little mental notes take little notes and we'll uh, share our thoughts between each other we're just like yeah man yo this is what it sounds like this is, did you hear this did you not hear this or were you missing this or were you not missing this did it sound better towed in did it sound better facing forward or should i pull it out three feet from the wall or should i can we kick it back a little further closer to the wall um i always hate those comments too like hey man did you uh did you listen on access did you did you uh use this speaker cable did you do this do it i'm like dude it's not the fucking first time we reviewed speakers before we know what the hell we're doing and um yeah man it's just the edgier sound of speaker i mean what, what can you say i mean i've had unless, unless all of our integrated amps sound exactly the same i mean it sounded the same amongst all the uh integrated amps that we use integrated amps and and i was just thinking to myself yo like how come nobody nobody says this in any of these uh other videos that i've been watching like i know you guys have gotten them for free because usually kind of what they do right so did they did they give them to you for free did they let you keep them is that why you're giving them a positive review i will say i'll be quite honest with you Sometimes I've gotten stuff and I haven't been uh, always positive on it. And then sometimes these brands don't want to deal with you again because you don't give them something positive. Like you don't give them a positive review. So I mean, if there's been something on my channel that you've seen in the past and there's been a newer something come out and you haven't seen that newer version come out, that's probably why. 
Because some of these companies, they just want you to give them like positive, positive feedback. It's all good. So that, that that was our take on that, man. The LS50 Metas, I wanted to be blown away by it. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's still a good speaker. I I would definitely own it. Yo, if they yo, if Kef was gonna give me some LS50 Metas, for sure, I would definitely keep them. They they would still they would sit my repertoire of speakers for sure, no doubt. Uh, awesome. They are great sound of speakers. Don't get me wrong, they're great sound of speakers. But in compare for just for comparison's sake. That's why I like to do. Uh, that's like, that's why when we do like these speaker reviews, I like I like to have like I like to do a comparison rather than just outright saying, uh, yo, this is what the speaker sounds like. Like when I watch these other reviews, and they're just like, oh man, yo, speaker A, this is what speaker A sounds like, and there's no speaker B. But then it's like, uh, man, when I reviewed it to 12 other speakers, like, dude, you don't even have those other 12 speakers on hand. Like, what you talking about? Like, I want to see the other speakers on hand. Like, you're going from memory right now. Like, like, tell me that you compare the two, like, side by side. Not just, like, don't tell me you're doing a review and you're just, like, you're basing, you're basing this comparison off your memory. Like, I want to know that you actually compared them side by side. Like, a lot of, like, a lot of these other reviews, they just... They're just like, yo, I just reviewed the speaker and it's like, uh, this is what it sounds like. But then they're like, uh, when I reviewed this other speaker a year ago, I think this one sounds better. I'm like, how do you even know? You don't even have it anymore. You're just doing this off memory or what? So I find it's easier when we when we do these speaker reviews and we have something else on hand. So it's, it's kind of easier to, to tell some differences, you know, whether good or bad. <coughs> so... So that's what we've been doing lately. Um, just like when we do like different, I mean, we got we got the uh, Denon A110 review. We got the Denon A110 review that's coming up, and we're gonna compare that to like the M33 NAD, and then we're gonna compare that to the Technics R1000. So we're gonna do like you know comparisons there, easier to tell, you know, especially with like integrateds and like pre pros. It's like if you just, uh, it's really hard to do like an amplifier or something like that. Just like, because it, it, you know, sometimes it's not like if you don't have like something else to compare it to, like amplifiers or pre pros, are you just trying to go off memory? Then, yo, that's tough. That's like fucking impossible, man. I'm telling you right now, that's like impossible. So I don't know how these other guys do it. They must have like fucking brains like an elephant. Like they can just remember exactly what these things sound like. But that's, that's like an amplifier comparing it to something that you haven't heard like if you spent a lot of time with with an amplifier and then you move you do the review for it and you move on to like another amplifier like are you really gonna remember what that sounds like like from two weeks ago or a week or a couple days ago that's a tough one so i feel like if you're gonna if you're gonna like review something it's got to be like you got to compare it to something else you gotta you gotta compare it like side by side with something else so I don't know how these other guys do it. I have no idea. So, anyways, that's that's my take on the fifty metas. On well, the fifty metas, yo, it's, it's, it's a yo good sound of speakers, but I do think the BRX is sound better, just overall better. Hi Shane, have you reviewed Golden Ear Triton reference floor sound sounding tower speakers? Good or overpriced? I uh, I've heard the uh, the Golden Ear Triton reference several times. Well, I've only heard them in like showrooms. I mean, I can I can get them anytime I want to. That's not a big deal. I can get them. The only thing is, it's just like you know, when you start reviewing tower speakers, they're huge boxes. They are take up a lot of space, as you can tell. I have no space back there. Look, at, that's that that's all small boxes right there. That's all bookshelf speakers and cables and subwoofers back there. And with tower speakers, it's like yo, I gotta have even more space, and I'm trying to get a house so I can have more space to do tower speakers and bigger screens and stuff like that. So as of right now, no, no, I'm not gonna review the reference towers anytime soon. 
although I did hear them at a couple showrooms. Also, I've heard them at Value Electronics. So if you guys want to pick up Golden Air speakers at Value Electronics, pick up Value Electronics. Also, if you want to get Value Elect or also if you want to get Golden Air speakers and you're part of my Patreon, I can get you discounts on Golden Air speakers as well. So just throwing that out there. But I've heard I've heard the uh the Trent reference speakers and they're they're pretty sweet sounding. I'm not gonna lie, I heard some uh I heard some uh Vic I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Victor Wooten. Victor Wooten, W O O T E N W O O T E N. Uh Victor Wooten. He has this song where he I, I believe he plays the bass. And I think I I believe they are playing that on the Trenton references and Every time he was, the finger was just like, bomb, 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 bomp. Yo, you could just, man, it was like so good sounding on those speakers. I was, we were just like, I think me and, uh, I think it was like me and Patrick were at the show at the time. We're like, damn, we're like, yo, where's the subwoofer in this place? Cause the, the, yo, that bass guitar was like so good sounding. Look it up. Uh, look it up on your co buzzer title. I'm pretty sure it's there. But if you got some good tower speakers and good bass response, yo, Victor Wooten, fucking beast. What a fucking good recording. But uh, is it overpriced? I have no idea how much it costs. I have no idea how much it costs. But, you know, I always feel like unless something is like a, an absorbently expensive, I mean, it's all kind of like relevant to, you know, I guess whatever you make in life. You know what I mean? I guess it depends on you if it's expensive or it's not like some people can afford uh some people can afford <coughs> fifteen thousand dollar towers and some people can afford a thousand dollar towers only and uh you know maybe fifteen thousand dollars isn't a lot of money to one person maybe a thousand dollars is way too much for another person so i don't know well it depends on the person i guess you know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? Oops, I'm bad. Statement Audio says, Hi, Shane. Hello, Statement Audio. Hello. Oh, here we go. Shane, do you have any comments on Crown DCI series amplifiers and their drive core technology? I can't say, I can't say that I have any uh, thoughts on that can't say i've heard a lot of good i've heard a lot of good stuff about them i think they're um as far as i can tell you know a lot of people i think they like to use those amplifiers to drive their subwoofers if i'm not mistaken i don't i don't know many people who use them to drive their main speakers i mean i could be wrong i guess but um i, th I think a lot of people use them for like their for their subs or if they've got some like like real theater speakers with giant horns or something like that where maybe a Macintosh might not be the, the, the best choice financially. So I guess it's good for like like pro stuff, I guess. But no, I can't really say if it's good or not. Oh Abdo, what's up, oh Abdo? Oh Abdo is a Patreon subscriber. What's up, oh? Hi Shane, do you recommend a Lumigen? It's a five thousand dollar device, and I'm hesitant whether to buy it. Would I recommend it? Well, oh Abdo, I will say that I damn, you know, now you got me thinking here. I'm thinking about getting one. Now I might be thinking about getting one myself, just because I could see it being useful, especially if you're watching stuff like on Amazon or. Well, Amazon or Netflix, because, you know, there's a lot of stuff on Netflix that's shot in like two to one aspect ratio. And there is, you know, stuff like uh, IMAX. I think I think more more for like the stuff that's in like two to one. If you're watching it on on uh, on uh, like Netflix, if you have an anamorphic lens, like for my situation, if I was going to get a Lumigen, since I have a, a stationary anamorphic lens, which is always kind of like stretching, it always stretches the image outwards. So if I was going to watch something on Netflix, I would have to take that image and shrink it back down, which is a preset. 
on the projector. So, which would which would take the uh, two three nine image and make it sixteen by nine, which works fine. So, so you don't need a processor for that. You don't need a Lumigen for that. But now with these movies that are not in sixteen by nine, they're like in two to one aspect ratio. You can't if you shrink it to sixteen by nine. Now you have black bars on the left and right, and now you have black bars on the top and the bottom. So there's no preset for the projectors to kind of like not squeeze it to 16 by 9, but to squeeze it to, to 2 by 1. So with Lumigen, you can, you can take it and you can squeeze it yourself to make it fit your screen. So you can f squeeze it to fit any aspect ratio, basically. Whereas um, without it, without it, if you have an anamorphic lens, then you're kind of stuck with what, what you got, which, which you get built into the... Uh, the projector so for me i've thought i've been thinking about that actually just for that ratio just for that reason for netflix stuff and even certain certain things on amazon prime too i mean they shoot it in two to one which kind of sucks man and um so it's like that's that's good for that or if you or if you just want to stretch your image out if you got 16 by 9 you want to stretch it out uniformly if you want to keep more of an emphasis on geometry in the center and stretch it more out on the on the sides, you can do that with the Lumigen as well. When I watch people stretching out their images with the Lumigen and they try to justify it, you can't really listen. Don't buy a Lumigen to stretch out sixteen by nine to two thirty nine by one. It's, if you're one of those people, you're retarded because you're you're just totally ruining aspect ratio altogether. It's fucking stupid. Don't do that. But I could see you using it for like something where I have, where you got a stationary lens and you can't fill it out. Like the like JVC doesn't let you stretch it, a two to one aspect ratio to your screen. I could see that being very useful. Or you just want to use their uh, their tone mapping. I hear the tone mapping is supposed to be pretty good too. So yeah, I mean, if you got such a certain situation, maybe a situation, situation like mine that I could say by the Lumigen, and since you are part of my Patreon, if you want to buy a Lumigen, I will save you money on a Lumigen as well. So contact me for a Lumigen. Oh, no beer, no beer tonight, Shane. Cheers. No, we just got the, we got water in a can. <clears throat> Uh, Mad Envy, Mad VR Envy would be nice too. Yes, it would be nice. I don't know if they're sending those out to people though. I wouldn't mind. Uh, wouldn't mind getting one. I, mean, I keep hearing about them. Wouldn't mind getting one. Uh, what else we got here? Hi Shane. Hi Shane. Would you say going from 5.1 to 5.24 Atmos system is a worthwhile upgrade if a receiver can do it. How much more involving does it really does it get really with two versus four Atmos speakers? Yes, it does. I would say, I don't know if you watch any of my 4K reviews, but there is this particular scene in a quiet place where only in the top front speakers does this raccoon run across the top front speakers just like pop, 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 right across the front two speakers but it doesn't do that in the back speakers although if you have it although if you have it in a four channel configuration you won't hear anything going on in the in the back at top speakers back height speakers so it's really um so it, so if you're so if you're watching the movie, it makes it feel like it's only happening in those right in front of your face, rather than kind of like directly above you or directly above or right above your head or right right behind you or what have you. So visually, it would match more of what you're seeing on screen. You know what I mean? So if it's like so when you're looking at what he's looking at on screen, he looks above his head on the screen, which would 
point towards the top height speakers. I could see if he was like looking at the screen, then he turned around, and then he ran across the top back speakers. That would make sense too. So I mean, accurately placing the sound effect to where what you're seeing on screen makes more sense if you can fit four height speakers rather than two height speakers. If that makes sense. So yes. Or even if you're watching like an airplane flying from front speaker, top front height, top front back, and then to bed channel back speakers. Makes more sense. More Movement is more seamless. So does it make sense? Yes, it makes sense. If you can fit it. If you can't fit it, then, uh, you know, then don't do it. Cool, thanks. Be great for those ghost-type upstairs movies. Yeah, man. You know, plus, if you want to, like, upmix, upmix, upmixing doesn't always work all the time, but... When it does, I mean, you get the full, you know, like I said, I mean, I, I guess it depends on how much space you got in your room. Like if you can fill the uh, the top speakers with, uh, I mean, the top, your ceiling with like top, with like top speakers, then, you know, you're going to get a better coverage above your head for sure. But all right, 90 minutes. I think 90 minutes is enough time. All right, guys, I'm going to call it quits here. Thanks for hanging out, man. Last minute kind of live stream. Thanks for hanging out.